This is Talking Mule Deer with your hosts, Steve Belinda and Jody Stemmler. Talking Mule Deer takes you on a journey to learn more about the Mule Deer Foundation, Mule Deer and Blacktail Deer Biology and Management, tips and tactics for hunting, conservation issues, and even features some of our corporate and celebrity partners. Now, let's start talking Mule Deer. Hi, I'm Jody Stemmler. We are here at the Western Hunting and Conservation Expo. And hi, I'm Steve Belinda, Jody's co-host for the Mule Deer Foundation podcast. And we have another guest speaker here today that we're very excited about. I'm very excited about. It's Jenna Waller from Skullbound TV. Jenna, thank you so much for being here. With I'm them. so excited. I will, first of all, I would never miss the Western Hunt Expo. It's one of our favorite shows to come to. And I am a very proud lifetime member of the Mule Deer Foundation. So it's a win-win being here. You know, we're excited to talk all of our hunting stories of the past fall season, but excited to see the new products and also uh, everything that the MDF is doing for conservation. So real quick, though. You say it's your favorite expo. We hear that a lot. I mean, this oh, is, I mean, absolutely. almost every single yeah. person who's come by has said that. Mm -hmm. Why? What, what makes it different? It has a feel to it. It's an energy, if you will. First of all, I'm a big game Western hunter. So I'm from Montana. You know, we <laughs> we uh, live to mule deer hunt, elk, bear, you know, you name it. And uh, antelope, everything, moose. And this show has an energy that is... It's really family friendly, which I love because I know the importance of getting the moms and the kids involved. It, I love that about it, but I love it that everybody is so nice and polite to each other. And it's just, I don't know how to describe it other than it's an energy. Yeah. You know? I think that's a good assessment. Yeah, and there's not... There's not tons of calls going off where you can't have good conversation with people walking through the aisle. And it's crowded, but yet as I'm looking around here on Saturday, tons of people here, I'm still seeing strollers walking by on, at a fast pace. It's not yeah. elbow to elbow. Um, the layout is so nice. Yeah, they, they intentionally keep the aisles very wide because yep. they want it to be family friendly. They want it to people to be able to stroll through and take a look at everything that's Who going on. Who wants to go through, yeah, a You're weekend right. expo where you can't even make it through the expo? And here I really think, you know, in two days you can see almost everything. Well, what I found is interesting is no matter where you walk, you seem to know someone. Yeah. Oh, for sure. You know, it's it's like the, well, that no. can be a good thing and a bad thing. <laughs> when I'm running late, it's a bad thing. If I'm running over, like I got to be at the MDF booth at one o'clock, I uh, you know tend to put my shades on, my hoodie up, and run over there because yes. because you do. There, I know so many people here. Absolutely. So just before we got started and sat down, um, you had the distinct pleasure of putting on muley antlers on three of the most adorable little boys Aren't they ever. they cute? And that's something I love about this show, too, is yeah. you, see, you see so many families and so many kids. So, again, women, families in the outdoors. Yeah. And you see these adorable kids walking around with their flapping little, little muley antlers. antlers. Yeah. And you wore them, too. So of course. I, I'm, I'm not proud. Say I don't <laughs> have to do my hair here at the show because I can just put the antlers well, on. Well, you it's see perfect. the kids actually paying attention to not just their cell phones. Yeah. But to the oh, stuff that's amen. going on. And, you know, we, we, Jody and I both have children. You know, they use their cell phones in that, but they're also into this as yeah. much as the adults are. Yeah. And I think that's pretty cool. So. It's okay if they use their cell phones as long as they're documenting their amazing yeah. time Absolutely. here. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and sharing that. You know, it's important, uh, you know, it's important that they're here on their social media sharing that because I'm sure some of them have friends uh, that are non or maybe even antis. And so when they see... You know, young kids, re teenagers having a blast and, oh, I wonder what that's all about. I mean, that that spreads like wildfire. So I'm okay if they're on their cell phone as long as they're sharing the expo. Yeah. Well, you know, my daughter, I'm going to put in a plug here. My daughter's picture of her first mule deer is in the magazine this, this month. month and, yeah. it's oh, the, and it's the expo. And so when I get home and tell her an extra so many thousand copies went out, yeah. you know, I think she's going to be really excited about that. Oh, so. absolutely. That's super That's exciting. Yeah. Okay. So now we'll, one of the things we actually skipped here is tell us about you. You live in the Bitterroot Valley right now. I do. But you're not from there. Oh, I can no. Can everybody hear it? I can, I can detect <laughs> a little of the oh, upper oh. Midwest. Oh, I? it's so funny when I'm talking to people and I, you know, I live in Montana. I live in the Bitterroot. And they all kind of tilt their heads a little bit, get that look in their eye. And they're like, Minnesota or Wisconsin? <laughs> That's what they say. And I say, yeah, I'm a cheesehead. I'm a cheesehead. I'm proud of it. I am from Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin. It's right in between Madison and Milwaukee. Okay. I was so blessed to have a dad. I'm, I'm, I'm the second of two daughters. Okay. 
So, of course, you know how dad, dad's dad are. Was he, he wanted a boy a little a bit. Boy. Yeah, he yeah, was. Yeah. But he turned me into one. So, <laughs> back in the day. Sure don't look like one. Well, <laughs> thank you. Thank that. you. Well, you didn't see me the first 25 years of my life. <laughs> I certainly did. Uh, at, it's so funny. I never. I remember sitting in the chair getting at the butcher, at butcher, barber shop, getting my hair cut. <laughs> or Not maybe it was butcher. It was yeah. butcher. <laughs> <laughs> I did grow up on um, Sitting in the barber, and I probably was. Uh, third or fourth grade and another little boy was in there and I'll never forget he looks at me and he goes are you a boy or a girl (laughs) (laughs) and I remember and I actually was kind of proud of that I was such a tomboy and uh and it's because my dad really did uh he just fostered an already innate passion for nature and so he was smart enough to realize that while my sister she's incredibly intelligent she always had her you know head buried in a book and very analytical and, you know, just a thinker type. I'm a doer type. Another funny story, my nickname was Sherman, as, <laughs> as in Sherman Tank, because I just plowed through things <laughs> as a kid. Um, not thinking, just plowing. <laughs> and, uh, but he would let me sit with him in the duck blinds, you know, when I was little. Or he drug me along in the pheasant fields of Wisconsin when I was old enough to walk without complaining a whole lot. And then we uh, got into bow hunting sort of together. He picked up a bow when I was a freshman in college, uh, I think senior in high school. And I, all through my high school years, I would sit in the tree stands with my boyfriend um, and watch the deer. And it's kind of fun learning it that way, not hunting, but what you can get away with movement wise and watching the wind. And you learn a lot by just being out there. Mm-hmm. And then and from I, the guy's perspective, it's a great day. Yeah. Yeah. And being up He's in hunting. He's got his girlfriend yeah, exactly. there. Exactly. Right, right, right. Sharing it together, you know. And then I picked up a boat. So my dad shot a buck when I was a freshman in college. I'll never forget. uh, I got a phone call and he said, I shot a buck last night. I think it was a good hit. I left him be. Do you want to go in there with me and try to look for him today? So I skipped out on my classes (laughs) and went back home. I only live 15 minutes from college. And and I ended up finding that buck. And I'm like, Dad, Dad, over here. And my dad is pretty, he's a great, funny guy, but... I can honestly say I had never seen him that visually excited before. And I remember thinking, I want that. I want to feel that. Yeah. And so I picked up a bow. I bought a bow when I was 19 and I've been bow hunting ever since. Mm-hmm. I'm proud to say the 27th year, I think, bow hunting this year. Um, and it's just been such an incredible passion to be able to connect with my dad still. Right. And yet connect to everybody else. Like, you know, even even growing up in my 20s and 30s, and I could always hold those conversations with men. It, I was, people don't know that I worked in the investment industry for 10 really? years. Yep. Wow. I worked in the investment industry for 10 years. Outside, Where? Uh, in, for, at, in Wisconsin. In Wisconsin. Okay. Yep. I worked in outside sales and radio advertising for a total of six years before that. So, you know, which is the business world, if you will. But I could always hold those conversations with anybody because I was a bow hunter and because I could relate and tell stories. And and uh, so anyway, long story short, fast forward, I was I've been a freelance writer for years. The very first um, site I ever wrote for was Mm WomenHunters.com. And it was one of the first big organizations of other women where we could. It was just fun to share stories and write about new products. And I uh, volunteered, everything was for free, and it was just a great way to connect for me. And then I started submitting to magazines, and I had, this is over, like, I don't know how long ago this was, nine years ago, I posted on Facebook that Bow Hunter just bought another one of my articles called Independence Day about climber tree stands. And Mr. Jim Kinsey messaged me, and he said, what issue are you in? Because they just bought my article called Kingdom of the Brown Bear. And that's how we got to talking. And then we went on a writer's turkey hunt together in Nebraska. And he was actually producing a different hunting show at the time uh, on Outdoor Channel. But he really wanted to branch off and be um, in absolute control of his own TV show. Mm -hmm. So... I was also working with Animal Planet on a couple of projects. Believe it or not, they contacted me through womenhunters.com. We did a couple of um, shows on um, my artwork and sustainable living with women. And um, at the same time, Jim's like, why don't we do our own show? We'll call it Skullbound. We'll incorporate your artwork. We'll incorporate your connections to conservation because I was even doing that back then in Wisconsin. And so we literally hunted for about six months, gathered tons of footage, put together Skullbound, a pilot, 
went to SHOT Show, pitched it to the Sportsman's Channel. I believe at the time I was the only solo female hosted show they had. Wow. So they were all over it to promote women in the outdoors. And now we were airing right now currently our seventh season. Wow. Of wow. That's fantastic. And, you know, it, it. I would suspect as a woman of the industry and watching the increased awareness of women in the outdoors, that you pioneering that as well as some of the other celebrity women hunters is, is part of that growth, is seeing women doing this, being out there, being uh, being not just able, but fully capable and yeah. enjoying it and embracing it. And I think that's probably part of helping what the, the growth in our industry is. I hope so. I think so. I mean, I, 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 I know that most of my friends and I don't take it lightly. You know, we are, we're brand, all of us, whether you're on TV or whether you're just on social media, we're all branding hunting. And I think it's really important, especially now in the last two years, I've seen a huge influx of women in the outdoors, which is fantastic. But I also see some women making mistakes, in my opinion, of branding themselves or sexualizing themselves on social media. And it doesn't do them or hunting any favors. So I think we're going to be seeing a little bit of a shift in social media where credibility is going to be way more important than visibility, meaning how many followers, how many likes. Right. I, I love to see women, kids, um, you know, getting into hunting new, but I want to see it for the right reasons. I want them to understand how important hunting is for wildlife management. I want them to understand what we hunters are all contributing back so that when they get harassed in high school, a lot of girls do, harassed in high school or, you know, they don't know how to stand tall behind it and say, I'm an animal lover, you know, and I give back through the purchases of my licenses, you know, through the conservation banquets I attend, through going even to the expo, like we're doing more as a group hunters for animal rights than any other group in this country. And that's what I love to see on social media and brand and branding hunting to the non-hunters, which is really what we need to do. Well, and it's true. And, and women, particularly recently, you know, yes, there's a growth and yes, there's more visibility, but there's also been very aggressive attacks about women who, who are active hunters oh, yeah. recently. And oh, I know yeah. you have played a role in some industry efforts to try to help support those women who are getting death threats. Oh, yeah. Because they post a picture of themselves with an animal. Right. Oh, it's... It's crazy. I really have, I, so I've been experiencing that for, you know, six or seven years with Skullbound and, and be, being sort of on a visible platform. And my best advice to girls or women or anybody who is getting harassed is to not argue. Don't even banter back and forth unless it's a legitimate question. If there's rude comments, name calling, uh, death threats, um, you name it, trust me, I've had them all. But ban, block, delete. Don't yeah. even engage. You know, I learned that actually through a friend of mine, Melissa Bachman, who I have so much tremendous yep, respect she's a for. Great lady too. She unfortunately was thrown under the bus years ago with her African lion. You know, the antis loved it, picked it up, ran with it. She was, you know, way before any of this other current stuff going on. She she was put on Good Morning America, and and she's gotten major death threats. And she gave me the best advice. And probably about five years ago, we were working with the Sportsman's Alliance talking about just this. And she said, don't argue with them. Just ban, block, and delete them. Don't turn them into Facebook or report them to Instagram. Because all that does is those social media outlets will come back at you. They will shut your page down. And they say, we see that you're getting these threats. We cannot protect you. Right. So we're shutting you down. They don't come to your rescue. They do not back you up. So really, if anyone is rude and negative... Ban, block, and delete them. And if someone does pose questions, educate them, teach them about what we're all about. If uh, if someone and I, and I would say that goes for a lot of guys too. Yes, it's everybody. True. I, mean, it, I don't mean it, that. women I take really it don't. harder. I don't know whether it's well, the, the juxtaposition, but men are getting it too. For sure. Now. And, well, and my and daughter, quite frankly, then they can argue more and aggressively, yeah. and that uh, just escalates. I mean, my daughter has to tell people in her school, "Yes, I hunt too." Yeah. And, you know, as a hunter ed instructor and a person who teaches a lot of uh, the culture of hunting to young professionals, to students, you know, from 8 to 80, you know, it, it really gets to me that someone that, that you have to say, I'm a hunter too as a woman, you know, when are we going to get past that point? When is that ceiling going to be shattered and say, you know what? Okay, yeah, help, you know, not, it, it, to me as, as a guy, I grew up with five brothers who so was so male dominated that it was unusual to see women that hunted. 
Well, that was that leads back to what I was saying about before, though, is there are so many legitimate women out there who just love the outdoors and I love to see that the ones that are you know posing in their camel bikinis and daisy dukes and that's the problem and that's why women get that yeah. is or, or young girls in school you hunt too is because there's with with using it like some of them do, there's going to be negativity like she's just doing it for the attention. Right. They're objectifying. No, no. 95% and not, of girls, if not more, are out there because they love it and they're passionate about it. And there is no hunter, huntress. We're all just hunters, you well, know? And that's true. And, and, it, and for, I have a 12-year-old daughter who hunts as well. And I, um, it, it's, a, it's a life lesson of a respect for yourself, um, sure. a respect for who you are, the not engaging if you are, if somebody does talk, educating somebody who is intrigued on it. Yeah. But also that power of who you are as, as a woman, as a, as a female, part, hunting should give you that kind of, that, that strength, that, yes. that beauty. So to diminish that by objectifying yourself exactly undermines That's exactly what i'm talking everything about. that we are really as women uh it you know really and, does. and let alone as hunters yes you know so it, so yeah. yeah so i i i absolutely agree with yeah, with stand where tall in your credibility yep. and you know in your experience and um, yeah, that's exactly. I'll be proud of who you are, and never let anyone else define who you are. Amen. Absolutely. Yep. Exactly. So you referenced your art too, and yeah. I am. I have seen some of this amazing. Tell us about it. How did you get it started with that? <laughs> explain it first yeah. for our well, listeners. And let me first explain the reason our show is called Skullbound TV. I don't just cho- go chasing skulls. <laughs> um, I'm a skull artist. I started years back. My dad was. I, I've always painted for fun okay. with my dad. Even, you know, I took high school art, and he and my dad and I even took a um, a class, but I can't like at the local. Um, a Bob Ross. Here's your little yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Here's a little happy face. <laughs> and no, um, we took some painting classes together just for fun. And he went on a trip to New Mexico, and he saw this um, painted uh, Native American dot design styled ram skull, and he he actually took a Polaroid picture. No kidding, that's how old I am. <laughs> he took a Polaroid, but brought it home. And I goes, remember him too. So we're yeah, yeah. <laughs> And he said, you need to start doing this on all your skulls, skulls that I'd either hunted or deadheads I found shed hunting. <coughs> Excuse me. So I started doing that. And then they, I really did start with the sort of Native American style dot designs and patterns and started painting them some scenery and had them in a local art store in Wisconsin, started doing them for friends. And uh, and uh, one thing led to another and they just it just sort of exploded. And then... Um, I, a friend, um, Kevin, a, a Kevin, a friend of mine actually said, have you seen these? these? And he sent me a link to this um, African artist who beads them, but her beading is like often like Native American beading where they stitch the beads onto oh, wow. fabric and then the fabric is laid onto the skull. They're intricate and beautiful. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, just got so inspired by that and started working with arrowheads and Everything from stoning them to arrowheads to now Swarovski crystals and turquoise and wow, you name it. They are stunning. Oh, they are they, absolutely beautiful. I really appreciate that. They're really different skull to skull. You know, some are real masculine with arrowheads and wooden beads and other ones like... Does the skull speak to you and tell you how the design you... I mean, does, I know that sounds trite, but no, no, I, no. I would imagine... It does sometimes. Sometimes though, people will say like, oh, this is going in, you know, a cabin of ours. I want it real rustic or... Or a real, I'd like the Southwest look, which is right. real turquoise right. and red, bright colors. Um, the one I have, I have, I've donated a lot of them over the years yes, to the Mule Deer have. Foundation. And this this one here to, tomorrow night is pretty special. It is a re- it's the largest skull I've ever worked on. It is a replica of the 2012, I believe, Antelope Island buck uh, shot by Denny Osted, a 271 inch wow muley wow. it's so it wide looks it's like beautiful. a tree yeah <laughs> it's humongous it was so fun well, the fun part of it too was they sent me just the skull part you know to right. do all my designs and i decided to bling it out we went 100 percent, like almost 100 percent swarovski crystals and a little bit of metal and uh i didn't know what it was going to look like with the whole, with antlers on until i got to the show here a couple days ago and I walked into the room and it like took up the entire table. I mean, it is you cool. can imagine. I've seen it sitting in there. It's it huge. Yeah, so you can beautiful. imagine what 271 inch 
buck looks like. And uh, it was so fun for me to get to. In fact, I'm going to bid on that Saturday night. I hope <laughs> no one thinks that's weird, but I would love that beauty back in my house. You give him back twice. Yeah, yeah, right? And I've never been able to have, like, that kind of grandiose skull. How long does it take you to do a skull like that? It's all so dependent on the size of the skull. Like, deer don't take me half as long as, like, a, a big buffalo skull or an elk. Mm -hmm. But pro I, I work a little bit here and there, you know. It's can be a little intricate, so I'll, I'd say total, oh, 10 to 15 hours for a deer. Not wow. that long. A couple days. But that's that's a lot of time. Yeah. So it is. And, that, you know, it, it's one other thing we as hunters get is the trophy. You're taking it, – it is it, – it shows – the hunt it, it gives that and this is another way to have a memory of that experience or these special animals right um, I, you know i think that's it, it, it's such a unique and creative way to do it i, I well, they're so you. beautiful and you know well, i mean it's art and it's, each piece is unique yes yeah, exactly. and that's what's really cool yeah it. and there are some guys who are like whoa that's pretty blingy that's not my style and there's part of me like well i kind of hope it's not like that's <laughs> pretty blingy you know but it's something fun especially for us you know hunters we've been hunting two three decades i sometimes having a little bit something different and fun is uh you know how many you know skull i i've been really blessed to be able to hunt all over the world and i'm looking for new things in fact i just made a bear vest out of one of my my most recent bear oh, wow. how many bears can i have in my house yeah. you know right. and you know i love them so much that there's no way i could not do something with the hide every single bear i think i've shot 13 in the last seven or eight years wow. and so yeah just like my skull work it's something new and exciting this is a replica the original is mounted somewhere you know this isn't a replica and what a wonderful way to give back and i do need to give a little shout out to doyle moss who graciously sent me the replica i think he had it made through um um, split image replicas, okay. and it is gorgeous. You would never know. And that Doyle Moss is with Mossback. Yes, um, with so Mossback. And, and he is the guide, and, and his guys are out with some of these amazing uh, yes. hunts. Yeah, I believe see. he was even on the hunt with the original was, buck. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so it was really special, to, and thanks to them, and a nice collaborative project that hopefully we're going to raise some good money. That's great. Well, now, we appreciate those donations. For sure. As a fellow Montana, I have to ask you, what's your favorite Montana hunt? Oh, everybody asks that. I can't. I don't have a favorite. I, I, mean, I love them all. Yeah, but I mean, what is um, there one that sticks out in recent memory? Yes. Is there one you yep. want to do that you haven't been able to draw? Well, it's the most challenging, which is probably the most. With Jim and I, we're a two-man band. And, you know, Jim is my boyfriend, my cameraman, my producer, everything. And, and a really cool guy. And a really and a cool lot guy. Of really cool dude. <laughs> and uh, we love archery elk hunting, of course. It's definitely by far the most challenging hunt to film with two people. Um, you know, he's he's a way better caller than I am. and he, But yet he can't leave me to call and, and walk away. You know, I can sit and cow call on my own a bit and, you know, it's just it's just challenging. Trees get in the way, and you don't have that clear shot, and you got to have it for camera, and so many things can go wrong. Wind is Gemini's worst enemy. We, <laughs> so where we hunt elk in Montana. Does it, it ever stop blowing? No. <laughs> it, it never stops swirling. And so we think we're in, and we're, we have had so many amazing close encounters in the last couple of years, and yet winds shift or, you know, you name it, or, you know, the cows, you know, bust off and leave the you know bulls running after him just everything can go wrong but this last year we hunted hard i told him i am not i'm not quitting until i notch this tag this year and um i did hunt wyoming before that was that draw five times never did even release an arrow in wyoming this year great great hunt so we go back to montana we had set aside like two solid weeks where we weren't booked anywhere else we were just going to concentrate on montana I think it was day nine. Well, we were hunting by our house, a unit that we drew. Um, it can't when they when the elk are in there, it's great. When they're not, they're not. You know that kind of place. And uh, got into a great herd on day two. Had six bulls in it. Nothing huge, but you know, to me, any bull is a trophy. That's right. With any your elk bow. is a any, trophy. Amen. Absolutely. Amen. And uh, anyway, had great footage, great encounters. Got you know within sixty yards of this raghorn shredding a tree and. Super excited, like, okay, they're in here. This is going to be awesome. We're camping at the bottom of the mountain. Went in there. It got a blizzard overnight. <laughs> went in there the next day, and we could not find an elk. And sure enough, we found a pack of wolves. 
and uh, it was, we have it all on video. We don't have the wolves on video, but we saw them with our eyes. We bailed out of the truck. We were driving up to get up in the snow as much as we could before we hiked and um, saw the wolves, bailed out. Jim grabbed the Nosler rifle and um, wasn't able to get on them, but it misty, all the mist was coming off the snow and they started lighting up and howling all around us. Oh, wow. And it was, we were thinking we were both going to notch our tags on wolf and it was going to yeah. be epic. And yeah. it, if anyone knows how difficult wolf hunting is, it's to me a trophy of a lifetime. Long story short, we had to change up game plans. We went over north towards the Rocky Mountain front yep. and uh, I was so blessed to arrow a fantastic bull this year. And that's, that's probably pictures. my favorite Montana episode this year on the show. It's coming up soon, but all of our episodes can actually be watched um, anytime they want on My Outdoor TV. Our yep. current season is only on Sportsman, but if you want to go back and watch any of our really special um, veteran hunts with amputees that we've taken out yes. elk hunting or you know any of our crazy bow fishing shows that we've done, um, you can go back and watch them on My Outdoor TV. But yeah, I'd say that the Archery Elk Show coming up out of Montana is my, is our, my favorite hunt. Yeah. So just we're, we're coming close on time here, so I just want to ask one question about your involvement with MDF. Um, yes. You are a, an, a, an ambassador, a Spokes friend, woman. a spokeswoman. You are, you're very engaged for MDF because you're an avid mule deer hunter on your own. Right. Tell me about your relationship with the organization, why it was important to you to, to be affiliated with a group like MDF. Well, you know, the mule deer is an icon of the West, and when I moved out to Montana in like eight or nine years ago, um, started mule deer hunting with Jim, and it's just one of our favorite things to do. We we hunt public land in Montana. You know, we might not have the big bucks like I'm looking at right here in the <laughs> MDF booth. Um, those are pretty rare to find, but we just love the DIY style public land hunting, and I know how much Mule Deer Foundation does, not just for muleys, but fighting for our public land rights. Um, I was actually this week uh, able to go on a capture and release project here, capturing deer out of the subdivisions, putting them back into the back country. You know, I just know how much Mule Deer Foundation does and I wanted to get involved. And so I've been involved with Mule Deer Foundation since the very beginning of Skullbound. Um, we do a conservation minute on uh, all of our, most of our, not all of them, depends on the schedule, but most of our episodes, but I've been working with the Mule Deer Foundation since the very beginning, and I've just been really lucky to solidify that relationship. I work hard for them because I know how, how hard they work, and uh, two years ago became a lifetime member, which I'm really proud of. I'm only a lifetime member of three organizations. I belong to a bunch of them, but that lifetime member status makes me really proud knowing that I'm giving back and committed. I think it shows a stamp of approval, and and uh, it's just super exciting. I'm, I'm involved on the local level. I've donated skulls to my local chapter in the Bitterroot as well as here at National for years. And uh, I just believe in everything they do. And I love the people. I well, love the people involved. Well, we appreciate you tremendously. Thank We're having you. announcements once again on the uh, on Expo <laughs> floor. So we are going to wrap up right now. But, Jana, thank you for, for yes, spending this much so time much. with us. You are truly, um, you're, you're, you are a, an ambassador for women hunters. You are um, somebody that I think... Our young daughters keep, can keep look up to, and, 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 and that is, we you. appreciate so. you being such a great spokesperson for MDF and for women hunters in general. So oh, thank, thank you. you. That means a lot. I thank hope you so much. your skull sells for a lot tonight. I hope and it does. Sure, it will. And thank you again for that donation. But Absolutely. We appreciate your time. Thank you. This is Jody Stemler. And I'm Steve Belinda. Until we talk to you next time. Thanks for talking mule deer with Steve Belinda and Jody Stemler. The Mule Deer Foundation is the only conservation group in North America dedicated to restoring, improving, and protecting mule deer and black-tailed deer and their habitat. MDF is a strong voice for hunters in access, wildlife management, and conservation policy issues. To find out more, visit www.muledeer.org and stay tuned for the next episode of Talkin' Mule Deer.